Uh, we're here today to welcome Professor Elstein, who is joining us to discuss Harry Potter, St. Augustine, and the confrontation with evil. Uh, Professor Elstein, among her many accomplishments, is a regular commentator on NPR and is the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics at the University of Chicago. So without further ado, Professor Elstein. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I didn't come here for this purpose. I'm actually here uh, because my granddaughter, Joanne Welch, who's right here in the front, had her choice of anywhere to go in the continental United States for a short trip with grandma, and she said, I want to go to Googleplex. Uh, so that's why we're here. <laughs> and, um, and word got out that I was going to be here via John Trowbridge, a uh, good friend of ours who is one of your Google people in Chicago. Um, so I agreed to uh, sing for our lunch, I guess, uh, by doing this. Um, it is very fitting to be describing um, Pottermania at this point, I suppose, uh, given that the, uh, uh, the excitement knows no bounds. The film opens tonight at midnight. Uh, the book is coming out soon. Uh, a few years ago, when I was at the Library of Congress, um, I did some work on the theme of uh, Harry Potter, St. Augustine, and the question of evil. And I thought that I would bring that up again, rethink it, and present some of this to you here today. Um, and let me begin historically. Americans historically, ordinary Americans, uh, have always been more comfortable deploying biblical language than people in many other places. <clears throat> Certainly nowadays, when the language of evil and sin and horror and the like has been banished from the vocabulary of many elites. Certainly this is true in Western Europe. It's true of a wide swath of our own intellectual and professional elites, including many in the Christian clergy. Speaking of sin and evil in such circles invites the suspicion that you may be too sympathetic to traditional religion to be trusted. Uh, it's easier to talk about syndromes than about sin. It's easier to talk about maladjustment than about evil, because evil seems very archaic, uh, very elemental, uh, perhaps too judgmental. Now, a few years ago, a friend of mine, a smart guy named Andrew Del Bonco, who is a literary scholar and historian, wrote a book about the death of Satan in American culture. And he fretted about the disappearance of this and other representations of evil. And here was his argument. He said, without evil, we will abandon any notion of the sacred, of that which should not be violated. Without evil, it is difficult to articulate what is good. Now, Del, Ban Del Banco argues that a gulf has opened up in our culture between the visibility of evil on the one hand and our intellectual resources for coping with it on the other. The repertoire of evil has never been richer, he writes, but never have our responses been so weak. We have no language for connecting our inner lives with the horrors that pass before our eyes in the outer world. How this crisis of incompetence before evil came about and how it has made itself felt in the United States is, he proclaims, a matter of grave concern and genuine puzzlement. His own mother, Del Banco reports, often told him, quote, with tears in her eyes, that Joseph Goebbels, who was Hitler's propaganda minister, had been the devil incarnate. Now, from my own childhood, I recall the hushed conversations carried out in a low German dialect called Platt Deutsch between my grandmother and my mother and my aunts Mary and Martha about what had happened in the old country, as my grandmother called it, until the day she died. Now what had happened was all too familiar in 20th century political history, the century of mass murder par excellence. My grandmother and grandfather's people were a very small, insignificant people in the overall scheme of things, a group called Volga Germans, a community of Germans living in Russia. They'd been brought in by Catherine the Great. During World War II, the Volga Germans were either killed outright or by the tens of thousands sent into internal exile. And my grandmother never heard from relatives left behind in the old country again. 
What was the charge against the Volga Germans? They hadn't done anything, but they were the wrong sort of people. The assumption was that their latent sympathies would be with the German invaders, and they were a foreign and alien body sitting amongst Slavic peoples, and therefore were not to be trusted. That was enough. Now, Del Banco reminds us that these sorts of confrontations with political evil are among the basic sources of identity historically for most Americans, for the simple reason that so many of us or our families or their families before them fled from someplace to escape such evil. And absent this shared sense of evil, he tells us, we are all left without the moral markers we once depended on for knowing who and where we are. So Del Blanco questions whether American culture, shaped as it has been by shared experiences of horror and oppression, can long survive as a culture without some reinvigorated sense of both sin and evil, including, of course, our own founding sin of slavery. Both sin and evil are important, he tells us. Sin, because it reminds us that we too fall short. Evil, because it is not just something out there. It is in here. And because there is no other accurate way to name certain horrific phenomena. Now, as you know, the authors of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are usually called deists and men of the Enlightenment. But this characterization is terribly misleading. Each was keenly aware of what he took to be God's providential design. Each believed it necessary to guard against human shortcomings and wickedness by building in a constitutional structure that forestalled a temptation to domination. This is James Madison's famous discussion of factions and the need for separation of powers. Now, Madison was keenly aware of St. Augustine's libido dominandi, or lust to dominate, <clears throat> and its corrosive effect on human life and institutions. After all, Madison had been a student of theology at Princeton University. The steady awareness of and preparedness to check wickedness that men tempted might succumb to is characteristic of the temperament of those who crafted our political structures. Now, all of this makes enormous sense, for evil is central to Christian theology. You cannot understand <clears throat> Christianity historically unless you grapple with what theologians call the theodicy question. If God is both all-powerful and good, how did evil enter the world? Now, we're not going to settle that question here. You'll be relieved to learn, but we need to Keep in mind powerful biblical imagery, the attempt to give a face and a name to evil. For all human beings without exception must deal with how to protect themselves and their societies from those who go over to the dark side, whether the subject is domestic criminality <clears throat> or international terrorism. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is a bit wobbly because of the medication I'm taking. I usually don't wobble, so I hope I'm intelligible. Good. <laughs> the fascinating struggle of early Christian theologians with this question helps us to appreciate what human beings are up to daily in their confrontations with temptation, sin, wickedness, and evil. And with that, let's go to St. Augustine on the question of evil and the way this will feed directly into our discussion of Harry Potter. Now, St. Augustine's is the most monumental of all efforts in the history of Western theology and philosophy to grapple with the question of evil. His confrontation is so significant because he rejected the temptation of dualism in which evil is always externalized and we, the good, are always exempt. And it is evil he's talking about, not some behavioral maladjustment. Now, Augustine's argument, I think, is very difficult for us to grasp. And I want to sneak into it by using a moment of Augustinianism from the 20th century, from 20th century political theorist Hannah Arendt, perhaps 
Some of you have heard of her as a preface to Augustine himself. Arendt is the author of one of the great classics about totalitarianism, a book called The Origins of Totalitarianism. And she also covered the trial of Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann for The New Yorker and wrote a famous book on that called Eichmann in Jerusalem. Now, there is a rather brittle exchange that Hannah Arendt had with a scholar friend of hers named Gershom Scholem, who was distraught that Arendt had shifted from the notion of radical evil, which she posed at the end of her great book on totalitarianism, to the idea of the banality of evil at the conclusion of her great work on the Eichmann trial. And this is what Arendt tells Scholem about the reason for that shift. You are quite right. I change my mind and no longer speak of radical evil. It is indeed my opinion now that evil is never radical, that it is only extreme, and it possesses neither depth nor any demonic dimension. It can overgrow and lay waste the whole world because it spreads like a fungus on the surface. She goes on to say, evil is thought defying because thought tries to reach some depth to actually go to the roots of things. But the moment it concerns itself with evil, it is frustrated because there is nothing. This is evil's banality. She goes on to say, only the good has depth and can be truly radical. So let's consider her words. Evil is banal, it lacks depth, it is a flattening of the world through a failure to engage it at its roots. It is nihil, it is nihilism. Now this formulation reflects St. Augustine's long struggle with understanding sin and evil. And it is a story in part of his struggle with and finally against metaphysical dualism, which in his day was championed by a group called the Manichaeans. In the Confessions in the City of God, Augustine offers an account that lays bare his conviction that evil is not a freestanding, active, autonomous principle of its own, but is instead a privation. It is a diminution. It is parasitic upon the good. It has no ontological structure of its own. Contrary to the view of evil as an active external force poised eternally against the principle of good, a kind of polluting force against which good is passive, for Augustine, evil loses any generative power. It cannot create. If we take the measure of the theory of evil that Augustine proffers, we can see something of that flattened wasteland that Hannah Arendt glimpsed listening to Adolf Eichmann at the trial in Jerusalem as he spouted deadening, responsibility-denying cliches more than a thousand years later. Now, Augustine had been searching for a world in which perfect good squares off against perfect evil. Such a world would prove handy because when things go wrong, one could blame the evil principle including, by the way, within a Manichaeanism, one's own body, because the Manichaeans believed the body itself was a source of pollution. So you could do what you wanted with the body, but somehow the spirit remained pure. Augustine tried that out, and it didn't seem to work very well. The purity of the spirit didn't seem to emerge. He knew it was wrong, so he kept struggling, kept mulling over the issue, and finally, it hit him. We can no longer claim that it is not we who sin and some other nature that sins within or against us. I prefer to excuse myself, he writes, and to blame this unknown thing. The truth, of course, was that it was my own self, my own impiety, had divided me against myself. So from that moment of recognition on, Augustine understands evil differently. He rejects the notion that God created evil as a full-fledged malignant principle engaged in a cosmic struggle with good. 
And in his mature understanding, evil is stripped of any glory. It is denuded, it is depleted. Evil becomes the name that we give when we are implicated in it to an ascent to temptation that may congeal into thoughtless habituation and a chain of servitude over time. Evil is a kind of non-creation, a draining away from that which is good. So let's consider then the picture drawn in his mature theology. God is generative. The world God created, including human bodies, is good. Evil is a falling away from that good. Man who has free will is the agent of this falling away, not because the body is corrupt per se, but because we can defile it, defile our relations with others, and so on. There is no such entity, he tells us, in nature as evil. Evil is a name for the privation of good. Evil is the turning of a limited creature, all of us, from the good to ourselves. We become our own principle, the sin of pride. Now, stripping evil of any grandeur is no small accomplishment. It's difficult for us to grasp. If you look at a lot of the current literature, the popular literature on the Nazis, they're often presented, as you know, as sort of glamorous, evil demiurges who dared to go where others hadn't gone before. There's a kind of dark, sinister glamour associated with this. That's what Augustine was trying to strip away and aren't a thousand years later. Now, listening to the stories of survivors in the Jerusalem trial of Adolf Eichmann, witness to the millions who died in Nazi camps, Hannah Arendt was determined not to permit Eichmann or any like him to attain the stature of romantic, wicked demiurges. No, she tells us, these were limited men and women. This is the banality of evil. Totalitarian evil destroys the living tissue of social life and civil society. That's the function of totalitarian ideologies and deeds. Good, by contrast, relies on the unrehearsed deed doing of ordinary men and women who, from time to time, are capable of extraordinary acts, like the villagers, a little village in occupied France called Le Chambon sur Lyon, depicted in a wonderful book I commend to you by Philip Halley called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. The villagers to the man, woman, and child took in refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe and helped them to escape. Their death-defying acts of rescue, offering asylum from Nazi terror, were generative, re radiating out, opening up new possibilities. Generativity or the banality of evil, that really is the question. Now, let me conclude this Augustine section in this way. The <clears throat> metaphorical representation of an absence, if evil is really nothing, is a difficult thing to, to express. How do you explore the horror of evil while denying it the status of a created reality? How do you name a life-killing negation? When we think of evil, we think of self-absorption, cruelty, resentment, self-hatred, even the laughter of the derisive and the mocking. Now, Del Banco comes up with a wonderful image. I wish I had done this. The image of the knot, K-N-O-T, knot. The knot does not exist in and of itself. It requires a material entity, a rope. Evil is the twistedness of the knot, not the rope itself. That is, it is parasitic on that which is and is in and of itself good. OK, now the part you were really waiting for, Harry Potter and the return of evil. Um, I'm going to begin at the beginning with volume one. Uh, I had some help from my grandchildren. Uh, I should forewarn you that uh, volume six uh, is yet to be discussed. I, didn't, I haven't got that far. Uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. But the others are in here. So let's see if we can make any headway. Now, as all readers of Harry Potter know, uh, Lord Voldemort 
or he who must not be named, is a brilliant wizard who has gone over to the dark side, rather like the fallen angel who chose to will wrongly and became Satan in Christian cosmology. The angels are sentient creatures with free wills. A major angel willed wrongly. Voldemort articulates his philosophy in volume one very clearly. It sounds, alas, a little bit like some of the um, bargain basement Nietzscheanism I get from freshmen at the University of Chicago. Uh, there is no good and evil, there is only power. No good and evil, only power. So Voldemort lives in a world beyond good and evil. This, of course, is a philosophy that offers an open invitation to all who would malign and harm and destroy. It creates a principle of exculpation. We are only doing what everyone wants to do. We just have the guts to admit it. Now, this evil wizard, having been reduced to nothingness as the first book in this series begins, is a kind of disembodied thing because his killing curse against the infant Harry Potter has backfired on him. And in volume one, he's managed, you recall, to attach himself in this very amorphous form to the back of Professor Quirrell's head, Quirrell being the teacher of defense against the dark arts at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Now, Voldemort's parasitic quest explains why Quirrell always wears a turban, because evil must not disclose itself prematurely. And Voldemort uses Quirrell to do terrible things, as he needs somehow to represent himself in order to act. Now, there's something about Quirrell that makes this parasitism possible, makes him a good host. And we're led to believe it's likely his hubris, his inordinate ambition. Voldemort, of course, the name itself means will to death, as I'm sure you, you figured out a long time ago. What has saved Harry against the Arvada Kedavra or the killing curse? The life-affirming, life-saving power of goodness, his mother's love and sacrifice. This caused Voldemort's curse to backfire. As Dumbledore says to Harry, your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark, not a scar, no visible sign to have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very soul, quarrel full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, will to death, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. Thus did this remarkable series begin. And, and as I indicated at the beginning, as evil disappears from much of our elite culture's understanding, children who know there is bad stuff in the world and puzzled to the point of obsession over it are being treated to a serious discussion by J.K. Rowling. And this, I believe, explains, at least in part, the power and popularity of this series. Okay, volume two, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Voldemort continues to act through surrogates. You'll recall he mind controls young Ginny Weasley, who, just a child, is untutored and how to fend him off. Victimized by the imperious curse, she does his bidding. Uh, things get very complicated, as I'm sure you know. Voldemort returns to Hogwarts using his younger self, Tom Riddle. Riddle had killed his own father because his father was a muggle. And my grandson reminded me, like us, Grandma, when we were talking about this. Um, Tom Riddle came back through his diary. Uh, eventually, there's a showdown as Riddle, the younger self in whom Voldemort has gained temporary, if apparitional, representation, targets Harry for death. He is determined to finish off what he, Voldemort, failed to do initially, and he also wants some of Harry's blood in order to regenerate himself. The basilisk, the snake-like monster, is sent to kill Harry by Tom Riddle, and Harry can't control the basilisk, even though 
Harry possesses the ability found primarily in dark wizards of speaking parcel tongue and communicating with snakes. And we all know snakes have long been represented as servants who invited the initial fall of human beings uh, from their status as good creatures to their status as sinning ones. That's often a mark, has been a, a representation of consorting with the dark side. And you'll recall at the very beginning, volume one, when Harry's under the sorting hat, and the sorting hat is saying, Gryffindor, Slytherin, Gryffindor, Slytherin, you could be great. You know, you have some of the stuff dark wizards have, and Harry's saying, Gryffindor, Gryffindor, not Slytherin. He's making a choice already to move away from the allure of dark greatness. But he has a bit of the temptation in him. Harry is saved by Falks, the phoenix belonging to Dumbledore, who blinds the basilisk and whose tears of goodness heal Harry's wounds. So we're left at the end with Voldemort, Riddle, dissipating, disappearing, still searching for some way to represent himself so he can destroy and lay waste. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to read Augustine's monumental City of God, and everyone should do that once in a lifetime, uh, you will find that he spends a lot of time, it's really f fascinating stuff, talking about how evil and the demonic tries to gain representation. Some of it sounds like B-movie scripts, uh, but it's great sort of culture critique. It's a lot of fun. Volume three, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban introduces us to the scariest of many scary things, the Dementors. Um, this is what grandson Bobby said about them. If Dementors kiss you, they suck out your soul. You may be alive, but you're destroyed. You can tell when a Dementor is nearby like this, it gets really cold. You feel like you will never be happy again. Dementors aren't human, they glide. They can't see, but they can sense where somebody is. They also have gross scabby hands like skeletons. Now, if a Dementor sucks out your soul, a feeling of emptiness dominates you forever. That vast wasteland of the self of which Augustine writes. In Harry's early encounter with the Dementors, the Hogwarts Express is plunged into darkness. The cloaked fingers, figures extend their scab fingers and, and draw long, slow, rattling breaths, and they suck the life out of the environment. Why? They can only deplete. They can't create. The cold, we're told, was inside his chest, inside his very heart. He was drowning in cold. He was being dragged downward. And later, Harry's best friend, Ron Weasley, said, I felt weird like I'd never be cheerful again. And this suggests one strategy for combating the spread of evil that is suffocating the life out of things, and that's humor. Ron and Ginny Weasley's madcap twin brothers, Fred and George, are irreverent cut-ups, and they keep laughter alive. Laughter helps to drive the demons away. And I think this also uh, spurs us to appreciate why so many Christian theologians you wouldn't know this, the way people think of theology, but they did. They spoke of good humor as one of God's great gifts. Hilaritas, uh, a reveling in the joy of life itself. That's a way to hold the demons at bay. When we move to volume four, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, we've got the Death Eaters identified. A Death Eater is one of Voldemort's servants, a wizard who's in league with evil. The story begins with Voldemort still struggling to regain a material form. He's in league with Nagini, a snake, and a servant, Pettigrew, or Wormtail, who does his bidding, including carrying him around as these kind of yucky, disgusting thing at this point. Um, does this not suggest that if no one fed evil, so to speak, it could not grow? It could not enact its deadly projects. It has no volitionality all on its own. The snake provides venom for Voldemort's consumption. Voldemort speaks to the snake in parcel tongue. As well, something called the dark mark appears in the sky. 
which means Voldemort will return. It's a magic spell of a head in the sky. There's a mark on the arms of the Death Eaters, like tattoos that appear whenever Voldemort returns or is near. Uh, you'll recall that Harry's name is put into something called the Goblet of Fire, so he's forced to compete in the Triwizard Tournament. Voldemort wants to get hold of Harry in order to kill him, to lure him away from Hogwarts, and to acquire some of his blood and then to murder him. And volume four concludes with an absolutely horrific, epic struggle between Harry and Voldemort. For Voldemort has managed somehow at that point to rise again, which is troubling for several reasons. It seems, at least at first blush, to suggest a kind of triumph of evil and the coming into a body of that which has no integrity and standing on its own. But Rowling builds in precautions. Voldemort is not one of God's good created creatures. He's cobbled together out of grotesque elements. He needs Harry's blood in order to gain some of the strength conveyed to Harry by the gift of his mother's love and sacrifice. And this is the way Voldemort speaks. His mother died in an attempt to save him and unwittingly provided him with a protection I admit I had not foreseen. I could not touch the boy. His mother left upon him the traces of her sacrifice. This is old magic. My curse was deflected by the foolish woman's sacrifice, and it rebounded upon myself. Pain beyond pain, ripped from my body, less than spirit, still alive, awaiting the opportunity to resurface and to be restored to a body." End of quote. I must say I was a bit worried when I learned Ray Fiennes was going to play Voldemort that he'd make him too attractive, but that seems to have been forestalled, so I'm a little bit relieved. Voldemort could possess the bodies of others, animals, snakes, being his preference. <clears throat> he finds a gullible wizard, he had found her, kills her, taking this rudimentary weak body at first, uses potions concocted from unicorn blood, and it is a terrible sin to kill a unicorn, and then adds to that snake venom, uses a bone from his dead father, the father he murdered, but he needs the blood of his foe. He goes into combat with Harry. The Death Eater is at his side. Uh, Harry, having been transported along with his classmate, Her uh, Cedric Diggory, away from Hogwarts. And during the battle, what we see are all those Voldemort has ravaged and killed, sort of appearing out of the end of his wand. So much damage, so much grief, nothing but the repetition of grief. Nothing new, just destruction. We see Harry's mother and father, and they give Harry instructions. Harry saved once again, the spirits of the good victims helping to stave off the curse of Voldemort. Harry makes it back to Hogwarts, carrying the body of yet another victim, his classmate Cedric Diggory. And Harry and Dumbledore send out the alarm. The battle against evil is once again upon the wizarding world. Harry is passed off as hallucinatory and attention-seeking. Dumbledore is dismissed and deprecated. The Ministry of Magic officialdom refuses to believe that evil must be fought. As I wrote these words, I must say, I thought of uh, Winston Churchill's long years in the political wilderness in the 1930s, uh, years he spent trying to rouse people to the dangers of Nazism in a rearmed Germany, and he was considered wild and hallucinatory as well until it was almost too late. Okay, volume five is the last one I'm going to talk about. As I said, I haven't written out my comments on volume six yet. Uh, well, Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix, the movie is about to open. Uh, Harry's clearly a teenager, caught in the tumult of that age. We see him fighting with his own temptations and his own inclination to harm. An awful sadist, Dolores Umbridge, comes to Hogwarts to teach defense against the dark arts, but not really to teach it at all, because children are lo no longer to be taught how to defend themselves against evil. They must be disarmed in their dealings with darkness. Harry's godfather, Sirius, 
escaped from Azkaban, where he's been sent after having been falsely convicted of the murder of Harry's parents, teaches Harry the inviolable rule, never, never surrender your wand. Along the way, the awful Umbridge becomes High Inquisitor at Hogwarts, then Headmaster. The great and good Dumbledore is forced to flee, having already been removed from his standing on official boards and so on, because of his resolute insistence that Voldemort must be fought. The Death Eaters, who were not free to roam, but had remained prisoners in Azkaban, escape. They're in league with the prison-keeping Dementors, who've also all gone over to the dark side. The students at Hogwarts form Dumbledore's army to learn to defend themselves, and they readily speak of Umbridge as evil as she extends her reign of terror. She's evil, twisted, mad, says Harry. She's a sadist who laughs as she tortures and humiliates students and turns some students, the known bullies and tormentors of other students, against, like Lucius Malfoy, um, turns them against the other students and makes them official in their capacity to torment. Fred and George Weasley fight her with pranks, humor, irreverence, there's a culminating battle in which Harry's stepfather, Sirius, dies. Dumbledore duels with Voldemort, who's forced to flee. And at long last, after so much more damage, Harry and Dumbledore are believed. This is very clearly a battle of good against evil. Now, Dumbledore tells the Hogwarts students that even those who champion good may do some of Voldemort's work for him, by spreading discord and enmity, by breaking the bonds of friendship and loyalty and love, as Voldemort would have it. When fights him, Dumbledore, who's a wise man, tells the students by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust, and do not surrender your wand. Never be without a means of defense. De for Death Eaters cheer at the news of torture, and murder, they revel in it, for they can only destroy. So I submit to you, in moving to conclude here, that the Harry Potter series, uh, whatever quarrels I may have with it from a theological or philosophic point of view from time to time, that's small potatoes in the overall scheme of things, offer America's children and children everywhere a picture of a moral universe in which very, very bad things sometimes happen. But none of us, including children, are without the means to fight back. Love, loyalty, friendship, solidarity, all of these protect and defend us. Garden variety disregard and mistrust, the splitting of friendships, envy, jealousy, these are the ways it all begins. One must also clearly name what needs to be named and not flee from the scene of battle. J.K. Rowling is helping children to imagine evil and to evoke it in modern Western culture from which it is frequently banished. Powerful children's stories have always done this, but we have quite mistakenly sanitized those stories, making believe all the while that we are protecting children as we do so. We don't want to frighten them, we say. But children know the world isn't always nice. They deal with petty cruelties and bullying and cutting comments all the time. And the original Mother Goose stories, with a lot of the scary bits, probably serve better over the long run than Care Bear. There are those, and I am one of them, who fear that if evil escapes our imagination, then it will indeed have established dominion over us. Delbanco writes, if the privative conception of evil continues to be lost between liberal irony on the one hand and fundamentalist demonizing on the other, we shall have no way of confronting the most challenging experiences of our private and public lives, end of quote. So how interesting it is that even as a kind of therapeutized vocabulary from which evil and horror have largely been banished prevails in the work of those who define much of what we think about and how we are to think about it. Children are reveling in a world in which parents are murdered by evil wizards or driven mad by the Cruciatus curse. 
Danger lurks in many places, and what is more, the good, like Harry, harbor something of the temptation and evil in themselves, but they do not capitulate to it. And that really is the difference. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Apologize for the wobbly voice. I'm on this new regime of medication, and it's, uh, I, I'm not going to faint away on you. Don't worry, but uh, it uh, wrecks a bit of havoc with my system at the moment. Um, so sorry about that. I hope it was clear nonetheless. Um, and I understand we have about 15 minutes for questions, if you have any. Yes. So it seems like, is this on? I hear you. OK. Um, so it seems like in Harry Potter, the, the type of evil that's presented isn't banal. It's, um, uh, there is some sinister glory to it. Um, and would you say you agree with presenting that aspect of evil? Well, um, children? yeah, I would say that, um, that um, in a sense, it's, it's mixed. That is to say, there is no doubt that we're fascinated by, by the wicked, you know, by the outlaws, uh, by those who, as I said, have gone over to the dark side. Uh, but there, is, there are also ways in which, it seems to me, it's not so much a glamorous, glorious evil that finally we are left with. That's not the image. But of all the destruction, all the deaths, all those images of people murdered, coming out during the Battle of the, of the Wands. Um, I think that's, that's what Rowling, I believe, means to, to leave us with, um, that, that Voldemort is, is a parasite. Um, he must be fed. Uh, he must, in some bizarre way, be nurtured by others who, uh, out of ambition uh, or malice, wish to be part of his project. Uh, but he cannot, again, generate. He can only lay waste. Thing, things are, become darker, and they become cold, and they become crueler, and friendships are smashed, and lives are ruined. And there's nothing very attractive or glamorous about that. So I would say, finally, uh, the banality of evil image is the one that, that pertains. Arne was very careful when she said banality of evil. She didn't mean to diminish what evil does. What she wanted to suggest was, don't imagine these people as dark heroes. They're not. They can only repeat horrible stuff. That's all they can do. They can't create. They can't generate. So from a theological point of view, what should happen in book seven? Well, from a theological point of view, uh, what should happen in book seven is that Voldemort is bested. Uh, and, there, and there will be costs, because the battle against evil is often very costly. Uh, but hopefully Harry, who has gone through so much, as well as Ron and Hermione, who have um, demonstrated you know, the solidarity of friendship throughout, even with some bumps along the way, uh, hopefully they will, they will make it. But, you know, one never knows. I mean, the, the, the battle against evil, the costs are often considerable. So I will be in line uh, midnight with, with Bobby. I don't know if you'll be there, Joanna. Oh, Jen, you'll be out of town, uh, waiting for the book. And we'll go back and get no sleep and find out. Uh, so that's how I'd like That would be very satisfying. But, um, but as we know, uh, the outcome in political history and so forth is often not fully satisfying. So it uh, depends on what R Rowling wants to do to us, I guess. Uh, yes? You mentioned um, in the beginning uh, Constructor Voldemort's uh, principle of power. Yes. Um, in evil, there's power. <laughs> And I'm just kind of, I was curious about two things, is how does that kind of go back to our lives and, you know, a, um, ambition? You know, people who desire to move and to, and to yeah. grow and stuff like that. How, I guess is the question I have is how, do, how should we look at power? Yeah. Um, you know, because yeah. we, you know, fight this or, or like how, how should we yeah. just elaborate on power? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, as you know, power is one of the, the great words and, and the complicated words. And if you look at the Latin 
a couple of Latin uh, words that are translated into power, um, you can see a couple of shades of meaning. Uh, there's potestas, which is power, as mastery, dominion. Uh, the kind of power that unleashes Augustine's uh, lust to dominate, that temptation. Uh, there's another kind of power. Um, the Latin word is potentia, um, from which our word potential comes. Um, the notion that power has a generative capacity. Um, it's the ability to create, um, to, uh, let's say, use your educated gifts to their fullest, one might say. And I see absolutely nothing in Christian theology that says people should run around being um, self-abnegatory, uh, you know, to a, to a degree that is uh, self-destructive. Um, use your gifts, create, generate, but always be alert to this temptation to dominate over uh, rather than to serve and so forth. Now, that's the easy part. Uh, the, when you get to questions of, for example, political rule and governance, there has to be we, we call the, you know, we call powers the dominions in a sense in the, in the antique world, the principalities and the dominions. Um, and there have to be structures of power, power in the sense of the capacity to do that which must be done in order to maintain intact a system of some kind. But hopefully that's a system that has enough um, free play, shall we say, so that power as potentia, that other notion of power is not quashed and power as rule, governance, dominion does not harden and congeal uh, and become simply the vehicle of you know, a certain kind of mastery over others that has this deadening effect over time. Uh, even worse, of course, the mastery over others that leads to the terrorists of which I spoke at the outset of the 20th century of, of mass murder. That's how I would start our discussion. I mean, obviously, we would have to keep going from there to talk about all of this. Um, I mean, there are reasons for why the Greeks had the notion of hubris, uh, for why in Christianity pride is a danger, and so forth, because there are very real dangers associated with, with power. Uh, but no society, I mean, you can't, there cannot be human society without power, power resting somewhere, power being something that can be created. Uh, Hannah Arendt's notion of power was that which is made possible when people come together for a common purpose. Uh, so for example, there are some examples in our own lifetime. Um, if you were in Prague in November of 1989, and you were part of the tens of thousands who flooded into Wenceslas Square, uh, peaceful protest, and you watched this uh, authoritarian apparat start to dissolve, that was a form of power that was generated at that moment. Astonishing stuff. You know, unarmed people going against this regime that just started to unravel, a regime that supposedly had all the power. Same thing happened in Poland. Peaceful protesters, solidarity. I was there in 1983 on the occasion of the second uh, pilgrimage of John Paul II back to his homeland. Um, and million, I mean, millions of people, as far as I could see, singing, waving banners, uh, calling for an end to the regime, and power was being generated, a moral power of a kind that becomes fungible. Now, it's the kind of power that, sorry to say, eludes most political analysts because it's not exactly located someplace. But nevertheless, things are made possible when people come together for certain generative purposes. And I think we can point to those kinds of moments and see a form of power that we don't think about very often. Um, and uh, I think the Harry Potter books perhaps uh, permit us to go off in those kinds of directions from time to time. Yes. I, I suspect that uh, the good and evil is, is, is one big part of it, but of course not the only. I mean, magic is fun. I mean, you know, think, think about a world where um, you, you know, things can happen in this remarkable way and, um, and where all kinds of stunning creatures uh, 
that, you know, you maybe imagined. It turns out they exist. I mean, you know, what's not to like? I mean, that's, that's exciting stuff. But I think if you, again, if you go back and look at the history of children's literature and how much the theme of children dealing with bad stuff has been a feature of that, there's something about that that attracts children because they're often dealing with some of their own tumultuous and not shaped inner feelings of fear, anger, and so forth. And uh, we either help them as a culture to understand that and to shape it, or we try to pretend it's not there. And pretending it's not there is the worst possible thing we can do. A few years ago, well, probably, as I get older, a few years is you know, like 20, um, there's a book by a child psychologist named Bruno Bettelheim uh, that called The Uses of Enchantment about the harm done by sanitizing all the, the children's nursery stories and so on, because he said they spoke to real things that are happening with kids at different stages of development. It doesn't mean you want to frighten a child out of his or her wits, obviously, but there's stuff going in the, on that kids themselves can't fully articulate, and we need to find some way to respond to that without overwhelming them uh, with it. And I think Rowling is really, for a certain age cohort, I mean, kids who've grown up with her 10 years now. You know, if you were eight when the first volume came, you're 18. You've grown up with her. Uh, that she's done a pretty good job of that. How about one more question? Or two, three, or however many. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Well, um, that might be a bit of a sophisticated move to expect a kid to make. Um, but I think that, um, that uh, let's put it this way, that the books help us to understand why uh, the word evil, even though, again, many in our elite culture don't like it, uh, why politically it retains such force. Um, President Clinton, when the Oklahoma City was bombed, spoke of it as a day of evil. 9-11, uh, evil. Um, the trips that I made to uh, Central Eastern Europe before the democracy changes, uh, folks there had no trouble whatsoever with President Reagan's characterization of an evil empire. They couldn't understand why some people in the West thought Reagan shouldn't talk like that. They said, do, do, do people know what it's like? You know, they thought the name was apt. Um, so I think the question is not... Uh, should it or shouldn't it be used for political purposes, but does it accurately name something that couldn't be spoken of with as much force and power in any other way? I think that's the question we need to ask. Obviously, it becomes a problem if the word uh, is bandied about too, too frequently, is deployed incessantly, it loses any of its force. Um, it shouldn't simply become a standard um, rhetorical device. Um, but I would submit that there are some political phenomena uh, that are accurately named evil. Um, this doesn't give us our marching orders as far as how we are to respond to that. Um, you know, you can name something, understand it as evil. Death camps were evil. It doesn't tell you exactly what you can do other than defeat Hitler, of course, um, to stop the phenomenon. So um, I think the connection uh, would be a bit rough for, for a child, but I have a hunch that for the adults reading these books, uh, that it is food for thought on how um, evil is deployed politically. Uh, that's, that's for sure. And again, whether it's deployed uh, well or for ill purposes. I, I would not banish its use. We have to evaluate that use. Yes. Well, the, go ahead. 
Okay. Well, I, I thought I'd guard against that by talking about the fact that, uh, in my discussion of Augustine, about the fact that he rejected um, the uh, total externalization of the notion of evil, and that uh, all of us have to confront temptations and uh, habituating ourselves um, to, to sin, temptation, evil, uh, along the way. Uh, so calling, let me just put it this way, unless you're living in a completely dualistic universe, naming what happened uh, on 9-11 is evil doesn't mean that you are thereby uh, exempting yourself as pure. It doesn't mean that at all. Um, you can accurately name that, it seems to me, as a horrific day when wicked things were done. Um, and that still leaves open space for you to talk about uh, any ongoing critical reflections you might have about the United States, its course in the world, the way it understands international relations, and so on. So by using the word evil, Again, unless you're devoted to this strict dualism, does not commit you to the view uh, that of, of complete self-exculpation, where your own self or your own society is concerned. Um, so thank you for giving me an opportunity to clarify that. Anyone else? How about we'll make yours the last question. Yeah. 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 I, I, the good question. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, the question has to do with whether one of the attractions. Um, I, I hope you got up the Harry Potter book. It's precisely the sort of Manichaeanism, the dualism of it, uh, because that clarifies the moral universe for us. Uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, striking way. Um, and I, I'm sure you're right. I mean, I think that's, if I were to have a longer discussion with J.K. Rowling about that, that would be one of the things we'd talk about. I, I dare say that day will probably never arise. But, um, but I do think that, again, she, she does build in these precautions by showing that at the very beginning, you know, it's Slytherin or Gryffindor. And, you know, now Harry, at each point along the way, with some lapses, uh, has made the decision not to go the route of selfishness and cruelty and so on. But he's struggling with it. He's struggling with these, these issues. Um, and since Harry, the protagonist, is the person the child is going to most identify with, um, I think that, that that's an enormous sort of help in um, making more nuanced the understanding of of good and evil as a daily temptation for the person. Um, I don't see anything wrong uh, with um, trying to clarify the principles of good and evil and the figures of Dumbledore and, and Voldemort. Um, there's undoubted power in that. Um, I think that you know dualism wouldn't have such a long life if it weren't so attractive. Um, and, and it's hard, as I mentioned in the discussion of Augustine theology, Augustinianism, it's hard to, it's hard to work against it because of the immediate force of it. Um, but I think work against it uh, we must because eventually if it prevails, then you know Harry becomes one of the pure, uh, utterly pure, and uh, doesn't have any of the, the sort of dark parcel mouth, you know, nasty urges within him. And uh, I think that's what needs to ongoingly be kept in there uh, in order to show the, the force of his own struggle with it. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.